Hi guys, Freddy here and welcome back to the desktop for another rules breakdown. Now this week, after doing a retro RPG unit on Monday, I'm going to be doing Sovereign Stone. Now this is a 1999 role-playing game from the worlds of Larry Elmore, but with rules by a number of people who are really famous for their Dungeons & Dragons work. We've got Don Perrin, Lester Smith, Jeff Grubb, Margaret Weiss, just so many famous names involved in this game. And it is fairly interesting. Now, for the character, I'm going to use one of the NPCs from the adventure towards the back of the book. If I flip onto page 158, I'm just going to use the cut purse here. And that's who I'll be referring to when we go through these rules. Now, skills are dealt with on page 63. And they tell you that what you do is you combine an attribute and a skill. So if we go back to our sample NPC on page 158, the cut verse, and we say he's going to do stealth. Well, that would be agility plus stealth. So he is rolling 2d8. Now, his target numbers are here. So if it's a hard task, he's trying to get 11. If it's average, it's 7. If it's surely impossible, it's 31. So, let's say it's an average task, so 7. He gets a 4, so he needs to get over a 3 on his next dice. And he gets a 4, so he succeeds. Now, what you can do is exert yourself as well. So, in some cases, characters may want to expend extra effort in order to succeed in that action. A character may voluntarily suffer points of stun damage to roll one extra dice for any action. Type of extra dice is rolled is determined by the number of stun points spent. So looking at the table before, how many stuns you want to suffer, you can roll more dice. So if you want to take two stuns, then you can roll a d6 and add it. And add that to your skill attempt. And that's how it works. You're rolling dice based on your attribute, dice based on your skill, and then if you're exerting yourself and taking stun damage. So, initiative is a little odd in Sovereign Stone. It's dealt with on page 66. And order of actions up here. And basically it tells you that whoever rolls highest on their action dice, for whatever they're doing in that round, goes first. So, everybody rolls their attacks in combat, or whatever they're doing, and whoever rolls the highest goes first. But, people who have already rolled who are affected, can change their action. So if you've rolled to attack somebody, they roll to attack you and they roll higher, you can then change your attack to defend. Now the person still goes first because they rolled higher first, but you stand a chance of parrying their attack, whereas obviously you rolled lower, so you were going to get hit if you were trying to just change that standard dice roll to a defense. But let's deal with attacks. And there's quite a few things in combat to bear in mind. But first of all, the first thing you need to know is what dice you're going to be rolling. And that is very variable on the weapon. So we turn to the weapon table here on page 71. And we can see that a hand dagger uses attribute dexterity. A sword uses strength. Bows and things use agility. Now there's a few different ones, so whips use agility, etc. Now it's worth bearing in mind with swords that when you have a d10 or higher in a sword skill, the character may choose agility, dexterity, or strength as the primary attribute for the attack, and may change this from turn to turn. You may have, of course, use exertion as well. Now, looking at the cut purse, on page 158, we can see the cut purse has a dexterity of d8, and they have a bladed skill of d6. They are rolling a d8 and a d6. And as usual, I'll do a combat against themselves. So, first cut purse rolls 5. Not a good roll. The second cut purse rolls 8. A bit of a better roll, beating the first. So the 8 will go first. The second character goes first, initiative-wise. Now, the character being attacked can turn their attack into a defence taking away from the attack roll, which still succeeds, but is far less. Or they can decide 
to tough it out. Now, toughing it out means you roll your agility without your weapon, and that just takes away from the attack. It's unlikely to completely defend and stop the attack, but since the amount that you succeed by is your damage, it can lower the damage. So this character decides to tough it out, they're going to keep their attack, and they roll a 1. So they're only removing 1 off the person's attack of 8. So the total is 7 going through. Now other things worth mind is you can do an all-out attack. If you're doing an all-out attack, you don't get to do any defense. But you double your skill, uh, or the result on the dice. So he'd rolled 8, it would have been a 16. But if you're spending any dice on exertion, that's doubled as well. Or if you're going into an all-out defense, you get to roll your dice and double them. But exertion on that one isn't doubled. So you can roll exertion dice, but the costs aren't doubled. It's also worth mentioning that if both your dice come up ones, or if you're using the exertion dice and any two dice come up as ones, you lose your weapon. If the player rolls two ones on any two dice in the same roll when attacking or defending, the character is disarmed. If this happens during attack, the attack automatically fails to do damage. If this happens during a defense, the dice are rolled again, this time without the weapon skill, since the character is now disarmed. If they're using a shield and no weapon, the defender uses the shield, or loses the shield. The character must spend an action to retrieve the weapon or shield before either can be used again. Now, as I mentioned before, damage is the difference between the two dice rolls. So in our sample combat, the second character went first by rolling an 8. And the first character decided to tough it out so they would keep their attack. And they only rolled a 1. So the difference is 7 between those. So that's 7 points of damage. If they are using a weapon, certain weapons have damage bonuses. So a broadsword has 2 extra. So if he was using a broadsword, the 7 would go up to 9. If he was using a two-handed sword, the 7 would go up to 11. Lances, if he was using one way mounted, it go up by six, and so on and so forth for the different types of weapon. Hand daggers, however, have no damage bonus, so it's just the base seven points that he rolled. Armor takes away from it, so like wearing chainmail, while your agility goes down by two, so any agility rolls are subtracted by two points. They offer four points of protection. So the 7 would actually only be 3 points of damage getting through. And cloth armor does 1, leather armor 2, plate, half plate 5, full plate 6. Using a shield uh, offers 1, 2 or 3 for small larger tower. And so on with that. But that's how you work it out. It's the difference between the dice rolls plus any bonus from weapons minus anything from armor. So health in Sovereign Stone is dealt with as life points. If we turn back to the sample character on page 158, we can see listed that he has 12 life points. They're basically hit points. But the hand dagger has no type of damage listed for it. Whereas swords do wounds and clubs do stun damage. If the weapon isn't listed, then it does 50-50 damage, but in favour of stun. So the 7 points of damage are split 50-50, but four points go to stun and three points to wounds. Now, if he goes over his total hit points or life points in combined stun and wounds, then he collapses unconscious. But stun damage is easy to get rid of. In combat, instead of taking an attack or a defense, you can take a second win. You make a willpower roll, regaining one point of stun for each point rolled. So if he is rolling a d6 for his willpower, he rolls a 6, so he regains 6 stun and heals them back. So he can carry on operating. However, when, normally when his stun and wounds are larger than his life points, he will collapse unconscious. But if his wounds outweigh his life points, then he can die. 
A character who suffers wounds equal to or exceeding his life points will perish within minutes unless healing actions are performed to reduce the wounds below the character's life point total. If a character ever receives enough wound damage to double the life point total in wounds, the character is dead with no hope of being healed. So, stun damage you can receive, and that's fairly easy to shrug off, even in combat. Um, each point of stun or shock requires a full hour of rest for the character to recover normally. But wound damage requires healing, and heals back far slower. Now, advancement is dealt with on page 49. And is dealt with through progression points, which are basically your experience points that you spend. It's not a level-based system. So, to improve an attribute, the player must spend five times the next die level. For example, to improve strength from a d6 to a d8, requires 8 times 5, or 40 progression points. Now, skills aren't quite that simple. They have a cost on this table. So to buy a new skill, when you don't have one, up to a d4, costs 5 points. Up to a d6 costs 8. Up to a d8 costs 16. 24, 32, 64 for the d10, d12, d20. And magic costs change depending on which species you are, because each species is aligned to a type of magic. So it very much depends on what magic you're buying. But it's all dealt with here on page 49. So that is a brief look at the rules of Sovereign Stone. It's got some really interesting stuff in there. It does feel like combat's a bit clumsy because there's so many elements. But I think in play that can make it a very interesting system. I'm not keen on the initiative. But again, I think that might just be a matter of getting used to it. But anyway, I think I've whittled on for quite long enough as usual, so thank you very much for watching. But as usual, you look after yourselves, and I'll catch you later. Bye now.